Good afternoon for everyone uh, virtually. My name is Jack Ahern. I'm a professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Regional Planning at UMass Amherst. Um, it's my pleasure to, um, to have a small role in this panel today. Uh, a special welcome to all the students from the other um, programs in the region. Um, I won't list them all because there's quite a few, but and I noticed a lot of you uh, have been registered for the panel. <laughs> the um, the idea for this panel uh, was developed jointly with uh, Gretchen Rabinkin and myself. Uh, it, we were trying to think about a way to engage the students of the region because we know there's a lot of anxiety uh, and uncertainty about um, what's happening in the world, of course, but more specifically in with regards to landscape architecture and even more specifically about jobs and internships uh, and the, immediate, the immediate future uh, that you're all facing. So um, Gretchen and I uh, brainstormed uh, and we came up with uh, three outstanding individuals that you'll be hearing from this afternoon. Um, I'm calling them all um, successful mid-career professionals. These are folks that are in leadership positions in their offices, and they all have um, the important experience of surviving previous uh, economic recessions. This one may be different. This one may be longer. We don't know, but uh, we, Gretchen and I believe that these three panelists today will, will have some insights that we can all benefit from. We, the format for the afternoon is we're going to have some brief introductions then each of the panelists will speak briefly for eight to 10 minutes. And then we're going to have an extended period for question and answers. And that will be moderated by uh, Gretchen. And we're hoping to do the question and answer period with the chat function, because we have, um, we have almost 80 people uh, on, the, on the Zoom already, and there may be more. So please be patient on that. We'll, we'll try to... Um, take everybody's questions along the way. So uh, we're gonna start next. Uh, Gretchen Rabinkin is going to kind of review the results of a survey that many of you participated in. This will give us a better idea of who is participating, um, where you're coming from, and what your status is with regards to employment and so forth. So take it away, Gretchen. Great. And I just put into the chat box a link to it. Um, and it's completely anonymous, uh, intentionally so, because we're asking you as students to share what your experience is now, um, what you're thinking about, what you're worried about, and also actually what, um, what inspires you with landscape architecture. If we think back you know, to the ancient times of a whole month ago, um, what were you really excited about? Um, and let's tap into some of that too. Thank you all for being here today. This is amazing. Um, I'm simply, um, well, let me pause and just say who I am. I'm executive director of the Boston Society of Landscape Architects, which is the Massachusetts and Maine chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects. And we, um, our official membership includes about 650 um, students through seasoned professionals across these two states and many of you are part of it, and thank you. I'd also like to, um, yes, give a shout out to World Landscape Architecture Month. Happy World Landscape Architecture Month. Um, and it's, uh, it's an honor to spend this day with you. Um, very briefly in the chat, or in the survey, um, this gives us just a, a quick snapshot of who is here and where you're coming from. And there's, um, when I downloaded this, at noon today, there were 35 respondents as part of it, so that's the numbers that you're seeing. I hope many of you chime in and add to this, and so the um, survey becomes even more robust. Um, and let's see, can I share my screen? Yeah, there we go. Share. Okay, can you see that? Can you see that IMA slide? Um, thumbs up, Jack. Thumbs up. Thank you, Matthew. So uh, in terms of who's here, 
about two thirds, roughly, are graduate students studying landscape architecture. That's the big yellow there. Um, a few graduate students studying something else. Awesome, we're psyched, you're here. Um, and then undergraduate students studying landscape architecture or something else. So it's about a two third, um, one third split between undergrad and grad. Um, and thrilled that there are um, some multiple disciplines in this audience. Let's see if I can make my, there we go. Um, in terms of where you are uh, towards, looking towards graduation, about 30% um, of, of you or 30% of respondents are planning to graduate this spring, which means um, many more, about 60% have at least a year to go. So panelists, as we're looking ahead, there's, there's a good portion here that's saying, ah, what do we do in just in a few weeks? Um, but then also, what do we do a little bit uh, longer? Um, the accredited schools of landscape architecture within our two states are UMass Amherst, of course, the BAC, um, and the Harvard Graduate School of Design. We also have Northeastern University, Conway um, School of Landscape Design, and Smith, College Landscape Studies program. And so that you know, is starting to map out where students are coming from. RISD URI, it's great to see um, some more uh, people coming from across the country and around the world. Um, and hopefully many of you are on this call as well. So it's a mix, mix of programs here. Um, <clears throat> and this really gets to the heart of this conversation today, I think. Um, before the current pandemic, um, 60 percent uh, say that you didn't have a job confirmed but we're working on it um, and 30 percent did have something lined up for the summer and you know and only about 10 percent weren't yet focused on summer or post graduation plans but now you know in these few weeks this is what's changed and I think what I'll just highlight is that little yellowish orangish sliver um, which was only like one respondent saying that everything seems to be proceeding as normal. For everybody else, the picture has changed. Um, here it's 18% you know, saying the, the internship or job has been canceled um, with over half of you saying it's definitely on hold um, and might not happen. And so that's what's really bringing us to this conversation today. Um, so that's the broad demographic push that I have here. Let's see if I can unshare my screen and get back to you. Or Nathan, can you help with that and get us back to the panelists? Because with that, I think I'd like to turn it back to you, Jack, um, and then into this conversation. Forgot to mute. I'll turn off your sharing and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. We're back to normal. Okay. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, we're going to uh, start our panelist uh, this afternoon with um, Lauren Stimson, uh, who is a principal at Stimson Landscape Architects, which is a, a well-known nationally recognized uh, design firm currently located in Cambridge, Mass. and in Princeton, Mass. Um, Lauren is a graduate of our um, MLA program and uh, a, great, a great personal friend of, of mine, I'm, ha I'm happy and proud to say. And also um, through uh, some recent conversations with Lauren, I've, I've come to learn about um, one of the values of their firm, which is um, kind of work-life balance. And I'm, I expect that she can say something about that. And I think it's particularly relevant at this point in time. So let's, um, Let's please welcome uh, Lauren to the uh, to the panel. We're gonna thank you, Jack. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, really, really happy to be part of this. And I think if you had had this a week ago, I would be crying right now. But because a little bit of time is settled, <laughs> we've had enough time to sort of readjust and. Um, figure out how to do what we need to do to keep our company going um, in light of everything. So I have with just a couple of slides um, that I prepared just a few minutes ago. 
And I think it might help um, maybe just give the context of who we are and how it relates to You're muted. Okay. Can you see hey. the screen? Yes. Okay. One one warning is uh, if you accidentally press the space key, it'll mute. Space okay. key is a shortcut. I think that's my have what happened. Okay. That might have happened. Thanks, yeah. Nathan. Thank you. All right. So I think um, I just wanted to run through these things. These are sort of our four our tenets of um, what we believe in in this studio. Uh, we have five principles and we all share this love of, you know, land and craft invention. This firm was founded in 92 by my husband, Steve. We believe in this, um, everything has to be durable and we design for longevity. We love to draw by hand, um, love this idea of embracing slowness. And as much as we like to be innovative and we embrace technology, we never want to forget the relationship between the hand and the pencil or the pen. Um, and most importantly, we believe in work and life balance, which has really kind of set us up to, I think, succeed and weather the storm that we're currently in. Uh, we have two studios. One is in Cambridge. We have 21 people there, and we've got 10 people in Princeton, Massachusetts. So we've got this urban and rural situation. So we've got, you know, 21 people that are in the Cambridge area, um, all working remotely, and We've got, um, you know, the handful of people in the Princeton and Worcester area working remotely now. So we also have a farm. Um, my husband and I live with our two children. We've got an 18 month old and a three year old. We've got a farm and a nursery here in Princeton, Mass. And we've got animals and cows. And we use our farm as a test site, sort of like a laboratory for plants and for learning about trees in our nursery and um, Everyone in our office comes out a couple times a year, spring dig, fall dig, we use the farm as a retreat. And I think most of you hopefully, you know, are aware of our work. And of course, those of you in the design building, the photo on the right, um, we do a lot of institutional work in New England and beyond, a lot of um, residential work and park design. So we've been very fortunate to have some really wonderful clients and um, we sort of embrace the entire studio and try to try to appreciate that everybody is part of it, even those who don't come to work every day because everyone's got a partner or a spouse or um, a child that they're taking care of. So I think the way I'm framing this is that I have become very aware of when I, when I married my husband, I married this firm and what I've become very aware of is that I'm committed to a group of people, 31 people that, you know, depend on this institution, this establishment to keep them going. So when a crisis like COVID comes up, we all feel connected, but um, I feel very responsible for, for keeping people um, employed. And that is absolutely the most um, important thing that has been going through my mind every day. So. We have a good friend who is a uh, business consultant, and he sent me an article that he just wrote. Well, it was an essay that he wrote, and it talked about these two things, and I thought this was especially important to share with students because these two responses to the situation are um, something that's been sort of sticking in my mind and affecting the way I think about our practice right now. So the first response is something that, is described as transitory. So it's brief, it's temporary, it's fleeting. It's like the gut response to this. So um, when we first found out about the COVID thing, we had some clients in the first two weeks that put their work on hold. And they said, you know, for instance, Harvard University stopped all construction projects. So we had two projects on hold. Well, that's some construction admin that we had to stop. Um, so work for people that went away. Hamilton College, seven projects, they put all that on hold. That's a huge bulk of work for probably three people in our office. So our response was quickly to assess um, our financial 
you know, everything. We looked at everything financially and said, okay, how can we make sure that we can stay gainfully employed with everyone on our team as a permanent part of our team? We don't want to lose anybody. So that transitory is like, how do you protect the people? So um, we, I haven't even had a chance to explain this to my team yet because we just finished applying for a triple P loan from the federal government to hopefully help us weather this storm. Um, I don't think many of the students are aware of, you know, you don't need to know the ins and outs, but it essentially is something that will protect us. And hopefully if we get this loan approved, we will never have to do layoffs. And that's something we just don't even want to consider. So if you commit to things like this and um, that, I mean, that's, if you commit to your company, then this is one of these transitory responses. Uh, but I think the more important response, which seems to me to be the thing that we're trying to weather through is transformational responses. So this idea of how do we change the way we work and this whole remote work situation where we're used to coming into a studio and leaning over someone's shoulder every single day, breathing down their neck, you picking up a pencil and making changes. And um, what does this mean for the future of our company? So I actually think that we've, the first few weeks, like I said, were really difficult. Um, and we spent a lot of time sort of hemming and hawing, feeling like we were victims and the stinks and how do we do this? And now I'm in this position where I feel like, you know what, if we had just taken on this attitude about transforming the way we think about how to run this company, we probably could have kept maybe three women in the last 10 years of my life here that had left because of motherhood. And we said, you know what, we really can't do part-time or it's not gonna work or it's just not the way this profession works. And now I'm thinking, screw that. We should be able to actually change the way we work in the future because we're making it work now. We are actually pulling it off. And sure, it's not perfect, but I think that there are things like if we can use this opportunity in this sort of situation that we're in to change our mindset, I think it's going to be a big difference. So right now, I guess I'm just being really candid because I think that these things, I just wrote them down literally 40 minutes ago. I think these things have a real, um, could have a real, you know, impact or um, you can relate to them as students. So the first is commitment, right? We've all committed to something. Like I said, we've committed to the people in our studio to keep them gainfully employed and to keep this company running. Um, and delegation and trust. I mean, this is like a part of it. We are delegating left and right because we're not all in the same space. So we have to keep people moving on projects. So it's a lot of conference calls. It's a lot of phone calls and FaceTime, but then we have to trust that people are doing the work. And I actually don't really care if they're doing it at 2 a.m. or if they're doing it at 2 p.m. as long as they make the deadlines, they're showing progress, and they feel good about what they're doing and it's getting done. And I think that's a new way of working. Embracing mess, I mean, I'm like on the toilet sometimes talking to people. It, I know that sounds crude, but literally, like you can't, if you're at home working and you've got a toddler and you're changing the diaper and you got a conference call in two minutes with, you know, the president of Bowdoin, like it just has to happen. And they sort people are forgiving. They get it. <laughs> you know, like everyone's sort of been there or they're in it right now. So I think embracing the mess, blending the home and work, that's one of the biggest things that I'm, I'm kind of loving and feeling like, Hey, I was always a person who had it all out there anyway. So why not just own it? And let's, be real about this. I love how I can see everyone's house and a home or apartment when I'm talking to them on the phone now and we're FaceTiming or we're doing this Microsoft Teams chat. And I can see, like, I love I'm looking at Matthew's artwork on the wall. I mean, it just feels, it just feels great. So um, I think students should reset their expectations, right? Like, so you don't get that perfect job this time around. Well, let's do something else that is going to be helpful to you. I don't know if it's an online drawing course or it's your own commitment to designing your parents' garden. I mean, we've all sort of had to do that or, you know, to like pass the time or you work in a nursery or maybe you just really work hard at your portfolio because you didn't really have a chance to make it as good as you wanted it to be. But 
I guess what I'm saying is we're not even doing the drawings the way we want to be doing them. So don't worry about how you're doing it. Just make, be humble and like keep, keep getting at it and keep yourself busy. You will get a job and you will get there. Um, I just think that this whole thing is going to, is going to be a new model for how we work. And, um, Right now we haven't, we have two interns that we hired for our Cambridge studio. We have not hired anyone for the Princeton studio. We have no plans to, you know, stop those internships. We want to just keep it going and we're still hunting for new work every day. So we're just going to get through it. We're just adjusting how we work. I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Um, very, very fine and appropriate words. Much appreciated. Now I'm going to introduce Matthew Cunningham. Uh, Matthew is a principal and founder of Matthew Cunningham Landscape Design, a, uh, a small design firm uh, located in Melrose, Mass, I believe. Um, Stoneham, Jack. Stoneham. <laughs> I, was in the I was in the neighborhood. I knew it was up there. Oh, no. I have been to your office. Um, and uh, Matthew's firm is known for its, um, its, the quality of its design, especially the attention to detail um, and, and craftsmanship and for the love and understanding of native plants. And I have visited Matthew's office and I can say from firsthand experience that there's a wonderful um, collegiality among uh, the staff. Um, they genuinely seem to uh, enjoy working together and have a, have a really beautiful culture there. So um, Matthew, take it away, please. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you, Lauren and Sherry for being part of this and inviting me to be part of this. Um, I also cobbled together a little presentation at the last minute. Um, that's sort of how things are rolling these days. Uh, not a lot of time to think or overthink things. So um, I'm gonna try to share here. So bear with me for a second. Okay, can you all see that? All right, great. So um, my name is Matthew Cunningham. I'm a landscape architect. Um, I uh, have been practicing for about um, 20 years now. I graduated from U UMass in 2000. Um, when uh, Gretchen and Jack mentioned putting something together, um, I think they, they captured something by asking us to tell you what inspires us about landscape architecture um, and how to relate that back to landscape architecture in the age of Corona. Um, so I have to go back to my roots, which is really all about context. And um, I think when you really start thinking about where we are as a society and where we are in this current situation that we find ourselves in with with the coronavirus um, I think we really need to think about how uh, beyond site boundaries and how the places we're from shape who we are um, I am originally from a town called Bucksport Maine which is about halfway up on the coast of Maine um, it's right where that little red dot is and I'm, I'm repurposing some slides here from previous presentations so hopefully uh, some of you have probably seen these but um, I've often thought of this map um, without boundaries, and I think that that's probably something that all of us need to start thinking about in, in this current time and place that we find ourselves in. Um, I, I consider myself a regionalist. I think of, of myself within the context of New England and within this part of our planet. And for better or worse, I think that um, a certain typology of work has evolved in, in my company's um, uh, approach and, and the, the style and, and um, context that we work, live, and practice within. Um, the town that I grew up in is along the coastline I mentioned. Uh, there's an incredible um, mid-1800s fort built out, of uh, built out of quarried granite juxtaposed to this unbelievable modern cable stay suspension bridge that spans the river. So growing up in that context for me was constantly this shift between um, 
looking at my surroundings, looking at old juxtaposed with new and looking at the process of weathering. Um, my dad actually in the lower left corner um, worked in this paper mill for 37 years and I grew up in a very blue collar family. Um, we, we didn't have a lot of money. We, we, my parents worked really hard and um, I think they instilled a lot of values in, in my perspective on um, how we live in our homes and in our communities. Uh, where I grew up is, uh, there's a heavy agricultural base. Um, this is a picture of low bush blueberry. And this, I use this image a lot because I, I think from a very early age, I understood the, the dynamism of changing seasons. And you can see the same blueberry field a few weeks later in the fall as it's turning this unbelievable blood red color. And I, I take tremendous inspiration from that, that multi-seasonal display of color. And, and as Jack mentioned, I'm a plant nerd and my whole office is filled with plant geeks and we, are, are, we thrive on native plant material. Um, we love uh, geology and, and the context of beautiful stonework. These are all images from Acadia National Park near, near where I grew up. Um, a little bit about my background. Uh, I, as beyond where I grew up, I'm a, an alum of UMass Amherst, um, a very proud alum. Um, after UMass, I worked at Reed Hildebrand for about four and a half to five years. And um, after Reed Hildebrand, I went to graduate school at Harvard. And um, during that time, I started my company. And so we just uh, have been in business now for 15 years. And um, one of the, the ironies out of all of this is that I, I've always been a garden designer. I, I love plants. I love working with, um, I loved working in retail a, as a college student. And uh, we build gardens and design gardens for residential clients. And I, I think for many years that has had a, a strange stigma attached to it. Um, and I would say that now more than ever, the importance of residential landscape architecture is at the forefront. I think this is, this is the time when people are realizing the incredible value of their homes, the importance of creating a safe environment for themselves and their families to, to live and to work within. Um, and as Lauren said previously, this is, this is a time where our, our teams, um, our employees, our, our, our work families, we're all starting to learn the importance of being able to blend our life and work in unique ways. And um, I, I don't think that there's any textbook written for this. This is the first pandemic that any of us have lived through. There's no hard, fast rule about how we should be approaching it. But in, in, in our company, um, we're, we also value life-work balance. And I think that that's something that most companies try to, to uh, indoctrinate in the culture. But this is a time and place for us to really think abstractly about, about how that is um, evolving. And for us, um, it's, it's actually evolving on a daily, <laughs> daily, hourly, minute by minute basis. Um, one, one thing I wanna say about this, uh, we, we create one garden at a time. We, we have about 50 or 60 clients active at any given point. And I've used this graphic on a number of, of presentations, and I, I just can't help but think of the importance of this right now, that um, this is an image, uh, an aerial image of Boston and Cambridge. And when you zoom into the rectangle in Cambridge, um, this is an image, uh, this is a, a, the red dot represents a project that we had in 2009. Um, that person told another person, and before we knew it, we had a second project in Cambridge. And then 2013 happened, and we had four, and 2015, and 2018, and 2019. And um, I know that's this is sort of eerily um, relevant to the spread of COVID, and I don't mean for that to be a, a parallel, but I think that it's incredibly important for us to understand um, what the impacts of our, our work are on on the culture of our society, on individuals, on families, um, on ecologies. I'm, I am fascinated right now to, to think about what the, the minimized reliance on fossil fuels 
for maintaining our gardens, for driving, for all of commerce, what is that going to do to our, our uh, environment? I think it's gonna have tremendously positive impacts on our landscapes. So I, I would encourage all of you to think about that in the coming months and years as, as this all unfolds. Um, so I guess lastly here, I, I, I didn't really quite know how to even approach this, but just navigating the daily life in the midst of a crisis, um, the, the work and life balance, I was personally very prepared. I had a, a roll of, uh, <laughs> of Trump toilet paper ready to go. Um, this is my new home office. So I'm sitting at my dining room table. Um, you can see our dining room walls in behind me here and you can see my cat Cricket is the sort of CEO at this point. Um, and then Cinder and Cola are also part of just about every meeting. Uh, my team, we are on Zoom and go to probably um, between eight and 10 hours a day at various points. We've had staff meetings. Um, I, I can honestly say I haven't felt this connected to my team in a long time. Um, we're having uh, quiet Zoom meetings just for quick questions. I'm, we're able to um, literally put drawings together and all work drawing at the same time, which is the first time we've ever been able to do that. Um, we're working through concept diagrams and through spatial diagrams, literally in, in real time. We're taking photographs from job sites and sketching uh, with the very limited palette of Zoom tools to create diagrams and conceptual ideas about projects. Um, we're still developing our, our 3D renderings and utilizing every single bit of technology that we have at our fingertips. Um, it's, it's, things are moving in real time. And um, this, this is a snapshot um, of, of Will Gardner, who's a, an alum of, of UMass, um, Gianna Cornicini, who's an alum of URI, and one of our amazing clients who uh, we're, we're in the full midst of a, a design process with an incredible client in Cambridge right now. And she can s literally sit here with us throughout a design charrette and draw with us, which is a pretty remarkable thing to, to think about. Um, we're, we're creating hodgepodge drawings and sketches that I think one day I'm going to look back at this time and, and at these drawings and think, wow, this was, this was kind of remarkable that we went from, um, from these very structured and very um, poised processes to suddenly anything goes, the kitchen sink, drawing digitally, photographs, collages. Um, we even, uh, Jen Stevens, who is a, an alum of the department, um, the, the two of us had a conservation commission hearing with the town of Wellesley um, online, which none of us had to leave the comfort of our homes. We sat and had, a, had um, our project approved. And I think that one of the things that we're learning from this is that um, we as landscape architects are probably some of the, the um, I can't think of a better field of professionals who are more equipped to be resilient and to adapt to a different work pattern, to a different way of, of communicating, and to think very strategically about our sense of place and the context in which we live. So that's, that's my take on things. And I don't know how to turn this back over. Stop share. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Good, thank you, thank you, Matthew. That was um, very, um, very nice to hear. Very thoughtful, um, beautiful words and beautiful work. So thanks again. Um, Sherry is here. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Sherry Ruin, um, also a graduate of our program. One of my first students, if I can remember, back uh, a few years ago. Um, Sherry is currently the uh, vice oh here's my <laughs> uh, sorry uh sherry <laughs> sherry is uh, currently vice president for landscape architecture at weston and sampson uh which is a um, quite a large multidisciplinary firm um and sherry um is one of the leaders of the landscape program there uh and does really fine work Cur and currently involved with a um master plan for uh, boston common you know, talking about important public spaces um, of the moment. 
Uh, Sherry is a born leader ever since she was a student and the whole time I've known her. She's also uh, become a leader in our profession. Um, she has been a president of the BSLA and she's currently the, the BSLA's trustee to the ASLA. So um, let's welcome Sherry Ruain. Thank you very much. I really, um, I'm psyched to be here. I appreciate it. I really appreciate being included uh, in the panel. And I feel like um, the first two presenters, well, first of all, Jack, very generous in the mid-career professional label. <laughs> <laughs> first two, yeah, I'll give it to you. Me? Me. I'll take it though. Mm -hmm. um, so being the older, potentially wiser, maybe not. Just older. Um, I would offer maybe a slightly different um, approach to sharing with the students that are on the line. Um, I did not prepare a presentation, um, totally on purpose, meant not to, didn't even want to. <laughs> um, but instead, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about um, the profession and how my personal experience, when I got out of school, it was not easy to find a job. That was right after the printing press was invented. And it was uh, really hard to, I'm just kidding. It wasn't after the printing press, <laughs> very, very shortly after. Um, it, was, uh, it was not an easy time to find a job. And then I was in the public sector. I worked for the city of Boston. Parks Department, and I decided I wanted to switch to the private sector at an equally terrible time in the economy. So um, I had another really hard time trying to make the switch. So these are some, um, these are life lessons from Sherry Ruane for all of you guys. Um, the first one is be true to what you're passionate about. Take some time to figure that out because that is what generates the energy and the love and the enthusiasm that will be tangible and palpable and legible to anybody that meets you. If you don't take time to figure out what that is, um, you're gonna have a really hard time connecting with people as a new uh, person in the profession. I remember I interviewed with Paul Liu and I had shown him my portfolio and um, one of them was a drawing of one of the uh, trellises in the Durfee Garden with the plexiglass and it was the Dean Cardasis special. But I had like focused on that for one of my details in, in my um, detailing class with uh, Dean. And he looked at it, he goes, this is amazing. Did you design this? And I was like, oh no, I, I just drew the detail. He was like, no, oh, that's too bad. Well, you should really try to do something unique and remarkable, even though you're entry level and even though, you know, really find something that speaks to you. And I was like, okay, thanks. I guess I'll take it. I didn't get the job, but good day. So my message is take the opportunity to really do some soul searching and figure out what resonates with you. For me, I found myself in a place where I just really love the public realm and I really love designing places for people, lots and lots of people. Um, Boston Common is known as the People's Park. It's America's oldest public open space and there's a lot there that just moves me deeply. And I feel like if you're able to find that in your career, and I know it's new for a lot of you, and I know there's a lot out there, you're sort of like walking up to the buffet, like, what do I pick? But take some time to actually give it some thought and really look through work and find out what resonates with you. I feel like between Stimson and Cunningham and so many offices doing such a great variety of work, um, take the time to really try to figure out what resonates with you. The second thing I would offer is, um, to Chris Pritchard's point on the chat, your network is absolutely the lifeblood of your career. So when I worked for the city of Boston, I was not doing any design. Um, I was really just managing projects uh, in the Emerald Necklace and working with landscape architects who were actually doing the design. And that helped me develop a very robust network of people in the profession. And I have relied on that every week since my career started. Um, and then I went to the GSD for my, and again, another whole network of individuals who continue to be incredibly important. So consider your professors. Jack has always been um, a 
really um, important part of my career since those early days and in the 8 a.m. plant materials class. I've relied on Jack heavily throughout my career for references, for advice. Really lean into your network because there is a collective investment, I think, that you should take advantage of. Um, and it's never too early to develop your network because truly you never know who's going to know somebody or introduce you to somebody that might lead to something else. And the last thing that I want to say um, before we open it up to questions is what we're seeing right now, um, four short weeks ago, we were, we were desperately trying to find a landscape architect with 12 years of experience, um, 12 to 15. Can't do it. Do you know why? That's because in 2008, the economy was not in a great spot. People graduated from landscape architecture and they were having trouble finding the exact job they wanted. And so they went into other fields. We now have this huge void in our profession of these 12 to 15 year people. And I guess I regret that that happened. And I would offer to you folks who are now looking out there into this very different but temporary um, cause, you know, temporary condition that um, it could be scary, but find something that makes your heart happy and do it well. Um, we had somebody who graduated from URI, couldn't find a job and went to work at a special needs assisted living facility because they just loved helping people. And they did that for two years. They did no landscape architecture. But when we interviewed them, when we economy was picking up and we met with them and said, so what have you been doing for the last couple of years? The way that they spoke about their relationship to these people clearly communicated to us that they were the type of person we wanted on our team. They obviously had a strong portfolio. That's another great piece of advice is tune that baby up and get that looking nice and sharp. Um, but I feel like that meant more to us as a team looking for a team member than any slick rendering ever could have. So that person continues to be an amazing contributor um, to our organization. So don't think of a job that's not quite right as a possible wrong decision. I would say if you're looking out at this now new, completely different temporary job market, um, find something that makes you happy and keep in mind that there's no wrong decision. The, what would happen if it's wrong is if you make that decision and then you don't own it. Then, then you've missed an opportunity. There is no wrong decision. If you decide you're gonna take a job stocking groceries at night at Stop and Shop, own it. Do it, make some money, stay employed, um, define what it means to you, and then move forward from there in a way that is um, tr is true to you. And I, I offer that because I feel like you can put yourself in a victim mentality that is easy to do. And actually, I feel like it's something Lauren was sort of alluding to is when this all first happened, everyone was like, oh, God, this sucks. I can't believe it. This is terrible. And sure, that's a natural response. But then you need to shift and you need to say, okay, I'm in charge. I'm in charge of how I handle this. I'm in charge of my attitude. I'm in charge of the opportunities that I take from this. And please know there is so much opportunity in this current condition that simply was not available four weeks ago. Certainly new firms are gonna emerge from this. New models of practice are gonna emerge from this. New superstars in our field are gonna emerge from this. And it is absolutely up to each and every individual to decide what they're gonna do with the opportunity that this presents. And I would say, don't look at it as bad news and don't look at it as a bad situation. Try to find what wasn't available in the, in the previous condition and look for ways that really are gonna sync up with what makes you, what brings you joy. That's it. Thank you, Sherry. That was that was fantastic, and and, and thank you all. You, um, I I couldn't be more pleased with um, the wisdom and the sincerity um, and the generosity of all your thoughts. It's really um, exactly what we were looking for, and um, really appreciate that. 
I, now I'd like to um, ask Gretchen to step in and, and coordinate um, some kind of a chat. Um, God bless you if you can figure this out. I, I wouldn't know how to do that, but um, we want to try to um, take questions from you and ask any of the panelists to uh, to respond to them. So I think the panelists could um, unmute their microphone so you can you'll be able to chime in um, kind of quickly, and then um, and Gretchen will um, direct questions to you. I think. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so I've, I've collected questions that were came in through the questionnaire. Um, and I also invite um, any of you to, um, to contribute questions through the chat. Um, and yeah, you can raise your hand or comment in the chat if you have questions. Um, and I think we'll start it that way. And I've, I've printed out a bunch of questions from where we were, you know, from the responses that had come in by noon today. And so I'm in some odd combination here of like printout and highlights and um, trying to monitor the windows on my screen. But within this, there's uh, some, some wonderful things to dive into. Um, I'm not going to do this in any um, order. So why don't, let's see, and some of these you've started to touch on, like there's one of how should I go about developing summer plans that advance my career? Um, and let me add to that, and how should students pursue finding a job when firms are working so hard at this moment just to re retain current staff? So let me start with that pair. Sherry. Yeah, I have a thought. Um, so it actually goes back to something Lauren said about the nursery. One of my first jobs out of undergrad at UMass was actually working for a design build nursery. I'd worked at the nursery every summer between um, years at UMass. And I have to say that working with plants every single day and seeing how they react and, and how they grow in a very intimate way was some of the most valuable learning that I could have done. And I think at first I felt like, oh, what am I doing? I'm like schlepping bags of mulch and I'm, you know, weeding pots. But honestly, I feel like the knowledge and the intimacy that I gained with plant material and that experience um, really has carried through my entire career. So I'd offer that there are probably a hundred different jobs that relate to landscape architecture, whether it's the garden center at Home Depot or a nursery or whatever, there is a way for you to connect with, you know, working at a um, quarry or a masonry um, operation or whatever. I feel like there are ways to get closer to the profession and they might turn up unexpected connections that you wouldn't have otherwise anticipated. So I think people should be open to all of that. I would agree. Um, one of the things that uh, I noticed in the pie chart graph that you put up, Gretchen, was the number of people who are um, grad students. I think it was 60% of the respondents on the on the survey. Um, you all got this. Like this is you're not you're you're in school right now. You've had jobs. Um, Allison, I see you. Like I, I see some of my students from the GSD in this, and I I think it's this is the perfect time for you to really think and assess what, is, what brought me to this point in my, my academic career and in, in my career in general. And you're gonna use all these tools as, as you grow into the field. And I think every single one of us who is a, a quote unquote landscape architect, we've, we've all gone through a less than typical process to get there. So I don't think that you should you should limit yourself to thinking, oh my God, the world is over and I, I don't have an internship in a, in a design firm. Um, you know, I, I often will, will chat with people about this is, you're a designer, so design your future. That, that's just basic principle of life, right? Well, and, and Sherry, you know, I'm gonna add a question to that as well as recognize that we also know that there's some people on the phone who likely can't see the chat window. And so in a few minutes, we'll, like, we'll open it up to callers um, to see if there are any questions 
um, for those on the phone. And Nathan, can you help us do that when, you know, in a few minutes? Yes. Let me, let, yes. Let me know yeah. and I'll, I'll mute them at that time. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, but um, I'm going to do a follow up for one of the questions that came through the survey. And I see there's some that are coming into the chat now, which is awesome. But a follow up to what you all were just saying, you were talking about, you know, gardens and garden centers and that, you know, what are there other skills that you didn't know you needed before becoming a landscape architect? Um, are those skills that you might, you know, one might dive into this summer or in a, you know, in a job upcoming? And how might those skills be evolving as we prepare for a post viral world? Well, I think um, everyone in this Zoom talk today needs to become their own technical and IT consultant, <laughs> for sure. Uh, Lauren, you're muted. And Sherry, you're muted. Can you guys turn your volume up? Or I can hear you. I just don't oh, want to okay. like slurp into the mic. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> um, I don't want to be the only one that talks either, so. <laughs> oh, were you done? <laughs> no, <I'm kidding>. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. No. I will say the technology aspect has been, um, we, we had to transit, all, all of us had to transition from, um, we had a VPN set up for our, our office and we had the first week it was not working properly and we had to basically, um, my staff would have to email me for files. I would have to go into our backup, email it to them, put it on WeTransfer. I mean, it was, it was a whole orchestrated event. But now, um, I'm sure many of you who are students have already figured out how to share files efficiently, but uh, you know, us mid-career professionals may not have been technologically savvy in some ways, so. Um, go, ahead. go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you. No, you. <laughs> I was just going to say it's funny because I think, I feel like we need to, you need to be, um, you need to be able to do both. The, it, the technology is important. I feel like it's sort of second nature to people now coming through undergraduate and graduate programs. But I think that the reliance that, I, personally speaking, on hand drawing right now and being able to quickly sketch ideas, whether it's on the computer. Actually, I'm not doing that yet. I don't have a tablet to do that. But a lot of people in our studio, I know the other principals are doing it that way. Um, but I, what I do is I have my FaceTime going in one hand and my hand going on the other and, and I'm showing people like that, like just quick ideas. Mm. And I think if you don't have that in you, I think this is the time to push yourself and totally. train yourself in it because um, I feel like I was one of the last classes coming out of UMass that they, we had hand drawing and I mm. think it's this dying art. and. Personally, in our studio, when we get a portfolio and it doesn't have hand drawing in it, I'm always a little bit disappointed and I sort of put it underneath some of the others because I think it's an important skill. When you're at a client meeting, it's pretty impossible to say, well, let me think about that. I'll get back to you in two weeks after I do the computer drawings. You know, right. It's really nice to be able to pick up the pencil and sketch with a client. Well, um, and then they get an invoice yeah. for something that they're like, well, why the heck did you even go down that road in the first place? Right. Because, right. Because, yeah. Exactly. I would say, too, that there's actually some really beautiful work that is a hybrid of hand drawing and digital, where even, Matthew, the slides you were showing of, like, a site photo with the sketch over it, I feel like, um, for us, our work product when we're still in sort of conceptual that's where we're heading that's yep. what is much more successful is that it's not polished and finished to the nth degree so it looks like it's done yeah. we're really still in that abstract phase where we're allowing the client and in our case the public to fill in some of the blanks themselves and to help iterate with us a little bit and i feel like without being able to draw and do that do some handwork that, that gets lost and it's not just sketching stuff it's also diagramming if anyone's ever been at a meeting or a conference when there's somebody doing um like the graphic record of the thing so they're drawing like images and they're writing the important words down it's sort of the uh, mind map of the conversation that is incredibly powerful skill and so these are things that can be um something you guys can hone while while in this time 
And it's interesting to me that that seems to be something that can work both with high-end residential clients or high-end institutional clients, as well as community engagement, you know, public meetings and how do we engage, um, you know, regular people in meaningful ways over projects is something that is also very much of the practice today and all the more so right now to do it digitally. So, you know, Matthew, you were showing an extraordinary residence um, that, uh, but that could just as well be done talking about, you know, the banks of Chelsea Creek, which was a yeah. and, phone and, call and that I was on earlier this morning in the environmental justice community. We, we just this morning, uh, we have a, a small um, pro bono project in our office right now. And we, we used, um, we used the zoom meeting to conceptualize our approach. And it, it was something that um, in our office, I mean, we're, we're, a 17 person office, there's uh, 13 or 14 landscape architects and three support staff admin. And the time to actually sit down and draw together as a team is, is pretty rare. Like we, we do a ton of hand drawing and sketching and rendering, but um, I think, again, fusing technology and being able to draw in real time with digitally. And Lauren, I love that you're using FaceTime. I can totally picture you like, holding the camera and yeah. Um, but I, I would also caution everyone listening here that's going into landscape architecture that the drawings are not the product. The garden is the product, the landscape is the product, the ecology is the product. So that that's where you, I, I think you have an opportunity right now to, um, and again, I, I know people are freaking out because money is getting slim and people are trying to figure out how they're gonna pay rent and, um, I think that those are all incredibly valid points, but there's also the point of learning outside the box and taking the time to learn things independently. Um, I, I, in school, I always challenge myself to have independent studies with people or to um, take myself on a, on a walk and literally hand draw plants. Um, you may not be able to work in a nursery this summer because frankly, the nurseries might be closed. Yeah. You might not be able to go to Home Depot because that might be closed. So maybe it's time for us to think outside the box a little bit and um, like go for a walk and pick a plant and draw it. And, and con Lauren said conceptualize, like don't just loosen up, move, draw, get a Sharpie, get some paper. I'd like to um, jump in with a couple of thoughts. Uh, I've heard some good suggestions. Um, a quick little list of things you might consider. One is to uh, pick up some online skills. Uh, many of you students have access to um, tutorials and online training through your universities and schools that, that are free at the moment. Um, so take advantage of those things um, and spend some time to, to learn uh, a new software or, or a new skill like learning, uh, learning how to do watercolor or, or take a sketch tutorial. Um, I, would, I would emphasize again, the, um, if, if you have the inclination and the interest, um, you can't go wrong by spending time sketching and make a sketch journal, um, join a sketching group, uh, an online group. Um, my favorite is called Urban Sketchers. Um, it's, it's a truly global group that does really beautiful work. and even just to, to subscribe to their newsletter is an inspiring act. Totally. Jack, can I, can I add one thing to that? That I, I think, um, Sherry also, you, you mentioned the, the process of iteration and um, you all have an opportunity right now with your portfolios and with your past studio projects to take it to the next level. Totally. Don't, just, don't just take the final product that you presented at your last, uh, your last presentation and put that in your portfolio, evolve it and put that in your portfolio and do those hand renderings and do those sketches. And if you really want to dork out about it, do a cost estimate and figure out what the heck that thing actually was going to cost to build. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. I feel like um, when, I, when I left UMass in 95, um, I had a portfolio that Joe Volte actually helped me craft. It was tortured, but came out amazing. Um, and that sort of helped me get my first job, but then I applied to graduate school and that was like, okay, you can't just 
take your undergrad portfolio. You now need to like amp that up. And so that was a whole nother round of um, digging back into stuff. Um, and that is absolutely fair game. And I think, Jack, I think you mentioned the online options right now. There's a lot of free education online right now whether it's computer skills, whether it's drawing skills, whether it's language skills, whatever that, there is so much content online right now that's free because of the current condition. Um, so I guess my offer would be, we all need to make a living. Um, probably none of us are independently wealthy except for Matthew's client in Cambridge with the blonde hair and the fancy house. Other than that, the rest of us mere mortals do need a paycheck at the end of the day. So, um, so get that taken care of, but don't let that be it. Don't let that be the end of the story for you during this time. Um, I have long have uh, promoted this idea that there is no such thing as work-life balance. It's just life. You have to pay your bills. You have to uh, do work. And if you're lucky, you're doing work that you love, but not always. Um, and then you've got family and hobbies and all those other things, I feel like this situation that we're in right now, this has really made that even more apparent. You know, I'm in the middle of a conference call and my 14 year old son comes down at 2.30 in the afternoon, like hair sticking up, just got out of bed. It's a Wednesday, um, you know, eating ice cream and walks behind me. And I was like, mother of the year. All right, so, <laughs> I mean, I think it's important to just embrace life the mess, embrace the mess, like Lauren said earlier, um, and understand that uh, what you make of it right now will actually define where you head. And yeah. so it's a huge opportunity to really um, leverage and to get pretty excited about, frankly. Um, to pick up on some of those things, you know, for everybody on the call who might not be a parent and might not be deluged with the avalanche of um, online, like homeschool um, improv stuff that's out there. There is a ton. And one you know, lens to take at it is every museum or every cultural institution, it seems, is offering some sort of online programming. A lot of it being you know, arts oriented, of course. So the Cooper Hewitt, for instance, um, uh, or Mo Willems um, for right. <laughs> any fans of the pigeon. A um, uh, uh, parent, colleague, friend, Addie, who leads the Portland Society of Architecture, so a frequent collaborator of ours up in Maine, um, was just telling me her parent thing of this week of saying, I've had enough Zoom preschool, a mom of a preschooler, and I've spent every morning on a different hike taking her four-year-old out. So they've looked at Forest Field Marsh. I'm literally reading her text to me, and she's teaching him um, how to ID conifers and grasses, um, which I just love. So wherever you are in life, you can um, pursue these things. Um, panelists, there's a, hint, there's a couple of clusters of questions that I want to give some attention to. Um, there's a cluster of questions just sort of around the nuts and bolts of, you know, and say like you as employers, is now an okay time to reach out to do an informational interview to you? And how do you do it so that you don't totally annoy you? Because um, you guys are uh, balancing a lot right now. So how might a student go about um, approaching a potential employer even for an informational interview? Should, you, should they wait to send out resumes and portfolios? It seems that firms aren't interested in hiring. So like how, how do they approach you guys without <laughs> yeah, I have a thought about that. Um, I would say don't take the uh, blanket approach. Don't just put word out and reach out to everybody. Find a firm or a person that, you, that resonates with okay. you, whether it's their work or you've read an interview they did or an article they wrote that really resonates with you. That's the person to reach out to. That's the person to send your resume and your portfolio to and to say, hey, I read this interview you did. It really hit home because of X, Y, and Z. And I'd love to talk to you about it. That's the person that you should be spending your time with. And that's who's going to want to spend time with you. If I got a form letter 
you know, sort of, hey, looking for an informational interview, it's, it's going to get deleted because there is a lot happening right now. But if somebody is earnestly and authentically reaching out because of a common um, passion or a common interest, that's where you're going to have the most luck. So I would say curate your list, be really selective and be really intentional about it. Um, and find a few folks that really inspire you. And if you don't get a response, don't let it, don't let it bring you down. Um, don't be a complete, uh, you know, I mean, tenacity is one thing, but like stalking is another. So there's a fine line, <laughs> but I feel like, um, if you don't get in with the principal, try a project manager at the firm, yes. right? Like just, I think it's about being agile and expressing your, your interests. Um, but I've admired people that haven't um, let my lack of responsiveness deter them sometimes. And they reach out again and say, hey, I know you're busy if, if you could just give me five minutes. And I have, and in a couple of cases, we've ended up having those people join the team. So I would say, um, yeah. Find find the groove where you really where it really resonates with you. I would add also that um, right before this happened, we were as landscape architecture firms. We were in the start of spring. We were gearing up for an incredibly busy spring on our team, and we we actually added two staff members in January and um, in beginning of March, and now these. These two poor people have been like come to work and then literally sent home and they're learning to work from home in a new office in a new culture and um, I think that that's we're not unique right this is happening to every single person you know throughout the whole world and we I think as employers um, when we emerge out of this I think I'm going to be looking for people who are adaptive and who can um I, I don't want drones like i don't want everyone to be the same person but i i do think that camaraderie with the team is essential in this this time and place and um i think that's that's probably stronger now than it has ever been agreed i think i was saying to somebody um recently i did a, a talk for another school and one of the questions was um you know how do you avoid being last in first out you know and i think gelling with the team and being genuinely engaged as a team member and taking it beyond just coworker, but but hedging into family dare i say family i do feel like right now my team i think matthew your point about never feeling closer to your team absolutely we are, because we're enduring a crisis together, so that inherently brings you closer, but I've seen people step up in ways that are just inspiring, and um, and the, so the last woman that we hired, she, um, recent grad, not very much experience, um, she's nervous, and she reached out to me and was like, oh my God, if we have layouts, like, am I the first to go? And I said, you have worked so hard and have done such a great job of being a supportive team player, um, honestly, I feel like you're an integral part of the team. That would not be my first thought. So, you know, there's no guarantees in life, but honestly, I just, I feel like that is important. And that's also why it's important that when you're looking for a job or looking for somebody to reach out to for an informational interview, that there's a connection there. Don't force it. It will exhaust both of you, you know? <laughs> and Lauren, you have some, um, some fields that are going to need some haying soon. So you can always get some. Uh, yeah, food out of this, I huh? mean, we uh, <laughs> listen. We're like the we're sort of like the that studio that we've got this whole like alter ego. You know, we Steve and I take the trash out. You know, we're not above <laughs> anything. I'm pretty sure Sherry and Matthew do too. At the end of the day, and when a push comes to shove, you think that you go to school, you study all this stuff, and you're going to do beautiful drawings, and you go to work, and you're going to fit in this like mold and you rise up rise up and guess what you get to the top and you're still cleaning the toilet because <laughs> it's your toilet and you care about it and you don't want anybody else to have like trash and dirt whatever the metaphor is that i think that i don't know back to this being humble thing and being creative about how 
awkward this time is. And I know everyone wants to know, like, if we send our portfolio, what's the point? I think the point is, if you want to work for Stimson or you want to work for Sherry or Matthew, then send us your portfolio, reach out. But if you're just doing it to do it because you want to get a job, then like Sherry said, your heart's not in it. You got to find the right fit. And I don't, I honestly feel like if, if we have the work, we're going to hire people. That's just COVID or not. That's what it's going to be. And I'm hoping that this is not going to be crazy for the next, I have, I have optimism about it. I think, I think some things are slowing down, but you know, it's not going to be slow forever. And no. I was talking to my husband about it. He said, you know, this is a blip. This is really mm -hmm. like a really small blip. And at the end of the day for people on the line, on the line, on the phone who have been through personal trauma or a tragedy, or God forbid, you've lost a family member that you were close to. This is what's most important right now is your health and your family and mm -hmm. taking care of yourself and work is always going to be there. So if you think you want to um, work for a certain firm or a certain company, go for it. Send out the stuff, you know, try to make connections. I think absolutely what Sherry said is right. I can count on my right hand the number of people who have ever contacted me beyond, you know, the sort of the, I can tell it's a form letter and there's nothing wrong with that. We all sort of do that at some point in our lives, but, uh, or maybe not all, but um, <laughs> I, I can tell when people have sent letters to multiple firms and sometimes our name is spelled wrong or they leave the other firm name in there. <laughs> so it's a little funny. We put it up on the wall and say, hey, look, they're replying to Doug and Gary's office, but they sent it to our, <laughs> sent it to us. Um, but I guess humor aside, I just think that um, the personal connections, they mean a lot. And I think it, we want to work with people that we want to work with. I mean, we definitely do more than just landscape architecture in our firm. That's for sure. Yeah. You know, with mm, the farm and the nursery sure. and you guys do too, I'm sure. I mean, running a company isn't just about landscape architecture anymore. It's about HR. I mean, Sherry's sitting here talking and I'm thinking, God, I wish Sherry worked for us. And like, you know, like she could be, running the, she could be <laughs> running the whole show here because that kind of pep talk, you know, that's really important. You need people who are like going to be, it's the kumbaya thing. Like we need to all feel like we're in it together and um, I don't know, students, you're going to get jobs and I, you're absolutely going to get jobs. Don't bail out and settle mm -hmm. for the wrong one. Just no. for and sure. This, this I, oh, go ahead. Jay. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead instead of kicking it back to you. Um, but you're next, Matthew, you're in the queue. Um, I just, I wanted to say to you, both of your points that we're going to come back from this and we are going to be busy as hell. Because yeah. so many clients have been on the verge of like right now we're doing construction documents like insane people because they want to have shovel ready projects for the moment that this breaks. We are so busy. People are working overtime. People are. Um, so I feel like, honestly, we, we had made an offer to somebody uh, graduating in May. This was months ago. They reached out and were like, so still hiring and we're like yes we're still hiring we want you you're a great fit we're going to find a role for you um we will be busy again and i'm personally and i know gretchen is helping me with this i'm trying to position in the minds of our civic leaders that parks are critical infrastructure yeah. and that landscapes are critical infrastructure and that just like water and sewer um, parks is a is an infrastructure system that absolutely needs to be pushed forward and so this is the time right this is the time to be making that case so that the public perception of parks is sort of nice to have and not worth taxpayer dollars that's not going to be the thinking after this because we're in such an amazing um, spot where people are realizing the value of public open space and their own personal open spaces and how high quality safe spaces to be outside are, are making a huge difference in quality of life. Mm -hmm. So all of that to say is it, this is in fact temporary. And I know that it probably seems bleak because society has trained us to think that we graduate from college or from graduate school with our, you know, mortar board and our diploma and we are off. Um, you're still off. You're still launching. 
but you just have a, a huge opportunity to not necessarily follow the status quo at this point. And so I just, I think it's awesome. Yeah. This, this is the first time um, in, in our lifetime history that all of us have gone, been going through the same emotional, we're all in this context together, right? And it's not dissimilar from 9-11. After 9-11, I was completely freaked out that I was going to lose my job. After I landed my first job at Reed Hildebrand, I thought, oh my God, I've, I've made it. I found a place I belong. I'm going to thrive here. And I was worried that everything was going to collapse and things things didn't things things kept growing and evolving and and you know the the uh recession of 2008 happened and i somehow made it through that and since then i've grown my company to to be what it is now and i think we're going to we're going to persevere through this and we're going to grow and we're going to go we're, it's it's constantly going to be changing and i think um one of the things that we've really i think started to improve on in our office culture is the, the idea of communication where we're having regular discussions face to face on zoom right now talking about the big picture and um i think this is happening not just in landscape architecture it's happening globally in every sector of business every community and i think that it's going to be a very dynamic very different world when we are able to actually go out and be in and about the public again. It's, and I think we're going to take tools from this experience and it's going to completely transform the way that we work. It has to. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. I'm going to, um, want to pick up on something you just said and then Nathan, I want to open it up to see if there's anybody on the phone who has a question. But just to pick up on both that point about communication, Matthew and Sherry, you're talking about parks as infrastructure and landscape as infrastructure. And that, you know, and as we're looking ahead too, to shovel ready or to stimulus or to, you know, sort of a, a national effort coming out of this, it's a critical time to be thinking about green infrastructure right now, yeah. nature-based solutions. You know, I'm talking about, um, Landscape has hidden, hidden superpowers is the <laughs> phrase that, because there's so much that's embedded into the work that you all do um, that is not immediately obvious to the public. And so as you're developing these communication skills, that has to be communication skills, both external as well. Um, and I know that within, you know, the, the, um, the colleges and universities across the country, there's enormous work and research happening around climate right now. Mm -hmm. So as you're digging into portfolios and reminding yourselves, you know, teaching yourselves or working on hand drawing and all of those things, that climate research is also incredibly important to keep developing and ideas and means to communicate that and share that with larger audiences as well. Um, Nathan, let's ask if there's phone calls questions, excuse me. Sure, uh, I see four people. So I'm gonna unmute each one and just quickly ask them if they have any and then keep jumping to next person. So oh, thanks. Uh, oh, and this uh, Lena Smart. Oh, she seems like she just dropped out when we did that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you scared her off. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next person is uh, um, Scarola. Do you have a question? Um, guess not. Then next person is uh, Liam. Okay. So um, much pressure. Yeah, I think <laughs> they that, forgot. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, okay, we'll just uh, move on then. Okay. Um, uh, let's see, there's a few questions here from international students or about international students and how the current, um, you know, current travel, current situation is affecting that, um, affecting job markets around, you know, different uh, visa statuses. Um, Sherry, 
you know, Lauren, Matthew, do you have any, you know, sense of that within the folks who are working within your offices at this point about how this is, you know, what international students specifically might be thinking about? We may we not have, have the answer yet. Yeah, I think, so we, what we've dealt with in the past, the biggest concerns and the, and the most attention has been directed towards the visa um, status. And I know that it's been really hard um, of late. It was getting hard and now I feel like it's even harder to deal with the visa offices as needed. Um, our company is very supportive and helps get the um, N1 uh, visas and other things, but I know that it's getting more and more difficult. So. That's something that um, has been evolving and I think increasing in uh, as far as like concern, um, that's been a concern. But other than that, I would say um, we've had great success um, having them as interns and then having them as, as full-time employees. Yeah, I would echo that, Sherry. I don't really have anything to share beyond that because um, I'm, I'm not sure of the current status of legislation, like if there's a problem, if you're an international student, and you want to stay in the country, if there's some issue with the visas now, as far as I understand, there isn't. But we have, I think, five people in our studio who are uh, working on, you know, under these visas that we also um, provide the, you know, the legal fees for and everything to sort that out and we just try to be as flexible as possible i mean in this situation what we're most concerned with is if people are if people's families are abroad it's been really difficult for them right now um so i've been you know trying to be we just had a woman who's actually from toronto and she um we're totally fine with her she just hitched a ride home with a friend and she's in toronto now working remotely so she can be with family and um, we think that's really important. So whatever people need to do to, to survive this, um, and stay sane. And um, unfortunately, we've got people from, you know, Japan and China and India who can't just hop on a plane and go home right now. That's difficult. But if they could, we would certainly consider letting them work remotely. Um, uh, let's see, I'm uh, skimming through the questions to see if there's any really big ones that we haven't um, dug into yet, but you know, there's a number of variations around how this, the current crisis is affecting your business and how, um, and these are things that you've been talking about. Um, uh, I think here's one maybe, um, a smaller one, and then uh, I think we can end with sort of the bigger one of where you see the profession going or where you see things going. Let's see. Um, I'm just skimming through the chat. Um, one thing that's most appealing um, to me about landscape architecture is the ability to do field work that it provides. How, you know, how is that changing for you right now under quarantine? Um, and how do you think that'll adapt over, you know, as this, as the rules loosen? That's that for us, uh, we're, we are an extremely hands-on firm. We love to be out in the field. We're, we're constantly out picking plants, selecting materials, driving to job sites. Um, we have not, most of the communities that we're working in right now have moratoriums or have suspended permits or construction altogether. So we have not quite got an answer yet on when those activities are going to resume. But I suspect that it, even if this keeps going on for a month or three months, or if we're into this in the fall, we're going to have to get really creative about how we communicate with contractors and, and other people in the field. Um, obviously, we all are, we all, all of us on here know how to use Zoom and GoTo and all of those platforms. But um, I think, Lauren, you're, you're, um, you using FaceTime, it's, it's not a tool that my company has used very often, but 
we, we obviously know how to FaceTime, but I think that's actually going to become an incredibly yeah. an effective tool. Yeah, it's funny. I was using it beforehand. I mean, I had, a, I had two kids in a yeah. span of 23 months, and I had these projects in construction, and I felt like I couldn't take a proper maternity leave. And so I had to deal with stuff because I was such a control freak about it. And <laughs> I couldn't let go, you know, so it was oftentimes, you know, I've had these contractors on speed dial, we would do the FaceTime for site visits, because I just couldn't get down there. I think it's really effective. Um, I do think that I'm sort of optimistic about this virus letting up in the warmer months. I have an uncle who's a doctor, you know, so he's like giving advice that this one's probably going to happen and then it's going to come back in the fall. I mean, we're all reading this stuff, right? But in my mind's eye, and I'm hoping what will happen is we're being conservative. We're not doing any site visits. Nobody's allowed. It. Even if they're doing this, we have clients who are like, oh, we'll do the six feet thing. And I feel like, no, it's not okay right now. <laughs> we got to get through this peak and it's for protection i mean we have someone goes to a site visit it doesn't matter if no one else is there you have to go what if you have to get gas what if your car exactly. breaks down what if something what happens? If you have to use a bathroom what if you i know i know i'm being accident yeah but that's exactly what it is and then you put yourself at danger at risk and then other people blah 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 it's the whole so this is why listen we're in it we're in it we're gonna just and it's so we get into debates we my husband and i get into debates about this every day because oh well what about the when are we going to be able to do it so we're using the may 4th deadline right that's a, as a deadline sort of a governor baker's school thing so that's where we are right now we're going to reassess on may 4th but so are you saying that you're hosting a cinco de mayo party at the farm and we <laughs> should all come out yeah, we'll all stand six feet apart still. Jerry's I think that's... margaritas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I don't know if that was answering Gretchen's question, but. No, I is. love the idea of Cinco de Mayo, though. <laughs> no, but you're right. You're totally right, Lauren, about the, it's not just about a site visit. It's about a lot of other things. And yeah. I think as a society, we typically are just very self-focused and well, I can go do this. It's fine. No, actually, there's a lot of other, you know, cogs in the big system and we just need to be cognizant of that. And that's why it's important to be doing what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. So as we wrap things up, because we're at 530, um, I want to I want to give a huge shout out to all the students who are here for this today and the students um, who have participated in other ways too, whether through the survey, you know, through the chat, through whatever means. Um, we will we are recording this and we will put it online. Um, Nathan has put in the chat the UMass website and we'll link to it from the BSLA website and I know Chris is on the line from ASLA National. I bet we can even get ASLA um, to uh, connect to it too. He's giving me the thumbs up. So we'll get, we'll get this out there. Um, and the survey is still live intentionally um, and I really appreciate some of the, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more of a statement or it's that food for thought that, you know, we'll take back to Chris and to National and, and think about it and to our ex, um, you know, is this an opportunity for BSLA or ASLA to um, come up with some, to also come up with some novel responses to this crisis, like some scholarships or research grants or things like that can, that can also help support students through this period so that this doesn't become another lost generation because we don't, you know, we need you in the profession. Uh -huh. We want you in the profession. And we um, embrace your creative thinking too about how we all get through this together. So thank you all for coming. Sherry, um, uh, Lauren, I keep looking at your screen and seeing Eleanor. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> um, Sherry, Lauren, uh, Matthew, um, Professor Ahern, are there uh, final words that you'd like to offer? I would like to um, to thank you all. You, you knocked it out of the park. Um, beautiful work. Um, I'm glad that we recorded it. And thank you for the excellent handling of the questions, Gretchen. Uh, a quick, I was, um, I had a thought about what, what to do next, um, because we, we're trying to keep some kind of a dialogue going. And, um, my idea is to have a, a kind of a virtual plant walk um, 
I'm going to try to get some real, some real plant nerds okay. to, um, because you know we can't travel far, but we can all travel in our own worlds, and we. It's a spectacular time of year to be outside, whether you know, whether you know these species like your family or or not, or you want to get to know them. Um, <laughs> I think it would be inspiring to hear from some people who, who really know plants and can uh, motivate, and help you to understand the, their uh, their beauty at, at this time of year. So that would be amazing, and that, and you know what? I, not only will it be amazing, but unlike the eight a.m plant materials class. I'm not going to sleep through it, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> so, so stay tuned. That'll be on the LARP website. And of course, any, anybody is welcome to, uh, to join. Cool. I, I had just one last thing um, I wanted to say, and then Matthew and Sherry can, you know, say, say their final <laughs> wisdom. Um, I, I guess I just I feel like someone's got to like write an op-ed or something for like the New York Times about what COVID's going to do for the field of landscape architecture. I think Sherry should write this, or Jack should write it, or Ethan Carr. We're actually we're working on it right okay. now. <laughs> it's this thing I think is really important. Like when has there ever been something like the COVID pandemic? Right. I look back at the Spanish influenza, nineteen something, eighteen or something. When I think about what's happening now, and I get an email from a client in Philly and she's like, look at how much like pressure is on our park system. I read this thing. Don't you find this fascinating? And I'm talking to people like how many people are in Pulaski park in Northampton? How many people are outside hiking Mount Wachusett? I got a text from a coworker who was like, we tried to hike. It was too many people. It's so stressful. And I'm, it's almost like when Olmsted designed Central Park, right? Like things had gotten so bad and there was such a need for outdoor space that it changed the way we thought about urban planning. And mm -hmm. I think this is that moment. Like, sure, we have these parks and stuff and, you know, things are like on the up for landscape architecture, but this is a really big moment in the history of our world in environmental planning. And like, the only other thing I can think about is when like, Ian McCard wrote Design of the Nature in yep. the 60s. I remember Jack giving the lecture, like the rivers were on fire and like that the environmental movement like launched out of that. So like, isn't this another moment in the legacy of landscape architecture? Totally. Pivotal. Yeah. So, and Chris just noted in the chat um, that Landscape Architecture Magazine is posting articles as well. So keep track of it. There's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of dialogue around it right now and- right. Gretchen and I are scheming. We'll see how we do. Um, I, I would say, you know, that this is one of the things that drew me to being a landscape architect is the fact that it's both a field of generalists and specialists. And I, I know that that's a lot of professions have that. Um, but I think as a, a, a company that's focused on residential landscape architecture, um, I think that we're poised to see a revolution in, in the way that people live on their land, the way that they connect with soil, with plants, with, with um, gardening. And I, I think that this is a moment in the history of landscape architecture, or at least the, the and again, this is lofty and I'm, I'm an eternal optimist, but I think that this is an opportunity for us to teach people how to live on their land again. They can have vegetable gardens and we should be designing edible landscapes and we should be designing for birds and pollinators and we should be thinking about the large picture and how we fit into the ecological framework of the communities that we live and work in. Because if we don't, not only do we have this pandemic, but who here has, we have climate change that we have to address on top of a pandemic. I mean, we've, we kind of have a lot coming at us. And I think um, if our communities and our ecologies aren't healthy, we, we don't have a basis to even start. So I think that is a challenge and an opportunity for every single one of you who are students right now and all of you who are on here that are professionals that um, we, it's time for us, this is a movement. This is a period in our lives and in our professions where we have voices and we have experience and we have the know-how to transform our communities and to make our lives healthier and happier. Well said.
I have nothing to add for the first time in my entire life. <laughs> um, and I've copied the chat and we'll make this part of it. There's a lot of good resources in that, um, including I'll point out the student, the Landscape Climate Archive. Um, that is a national um, library, if you will, of climate work that's being done by students across the country. And so to Matthew's point, um, this is something that hopefully you're all contributing to and already aware of. And if not, um, please check it out. Awesome. So thank you all for thank joining you. us today. Thank this you. Is awesome. 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 And to be continued. Thank you guys so much. Thank you very much. Be well, stay safe, stay healthy. Okay, goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Um, I'll leave the chat room open for a few minutes. I'll start recording, but let people just stay and hang around if they want. Thank you.